Hello friends, welcome back to another video tutorial from Shomu's Biology. And in this series of videos, we are talking about uh, the protein transport inside the cell. We've been talking about the protein trafficking and the secretory pathways of the proteins. Now in this particular lecture, we will see how exactly proteins are destined towards mitochondria and how a protein made inside the cell is transported inside the mitochondria. So stay tuned and watch the video. Now the first thing that you need to know before understanding the transport of proteins in different organelles like mitochondria, nucleus, chloroplasts in case of protein, uh, uh, plants, in all these cases there are two separate pathways of protein synthesis that are followed. Now normally the general way of protein synthesis that we know is when the ribosome is attached to the other SRP proteins and also attached to the ER or endoplasmic reticulum. That is known as a rough endoplasmic reticulum and the protein synthesized is inserted into the endoplasmic reticulum lumen. Now normally this is the pathway for the secretory proteins which should be released outside the cell. While on the other hand, the proteins which are destined for mitochondria or chloroplast, these are the proteins which are not generally produced uh, from the rough endoplasmic uh, reticulum. They are produced in the cytosol. So we have mRNA and the ribosome is translating that and making a protein in the cytosol itself without being attached to the endoplasmic reticulum and inserting the protein into the ER lumen. So here once the protein is produced in the cytosol, then we need separate proteins that will bind with their mRNA and, and actually separate proteins that will bind to the newly made protein so that uh, the protein can be linearized and can be properly transported inside the target organelle and generally we need a lot of heat shock proteins which are known as chaperones those are playing an important role in proper folding of the protein and guiding the protein into the proper destination so keeping in mind for the destination in this case the destination is mitochondria and if i draw mitochondrial structure it looks something like this I'll be drawing a structure which is simpler, so I'm not drawing any Christi here in the middle of the mitochondrial structure. In the simplest drawing, what we have here is the outer membrane, the inner membrane, and we have the matrix, right? These are the three regions of the mitochondria. Now, normally when we talk about proteins to be delivered inside the mitochondria, we're talking about delivery of a protein into the matrix while there are some cases where the protein needs to be delivered into the inner mitochondrial membrane or let's say like this and sometime also the protein needs to be delivered in the inner mitochondrial membrane as a multi-pass protein as you can see it here or even a single pass protein like this one so there are different types of proteins and the delivery of those different proteins and the location of the delivery are also different. We will see how exactly a protein gets delivered into the mitochondria with all these three type of protein destination that is matrix, inner mitochondrial membrane for a single pass protein and inner mitochondrial membrane for multi pass protein. Now once you understand the delivery mechanism for one, you will understand the delivery mechanism for all of it because they follow very similar pathways. Uh, almost every single pathway at the beginning are the same. So let's begin with it. As I told you at the very beginning, we have the mRNA in the cytosol and ribosome helps in translating the mRNA and making the target protein. Okay, so let's say here they are making the target protein. So once the protein is being made, let's say it gets released, that protein should contain a specific signal sequence at the N terminal end of the polypeptide chain. Now that sequence is a mitochondrial localization signal. So once they have this signal sequence, that means that polypeptide is tagged to be delivered inside the mitochondrial matrix. If it contains a separate tag, let's say another tag in the middle, that is going to target that protein to the inner mitochondrial membrane. That's how all the process of protein delivery works. There should be a proper address. Like if you, if you imagine this whole system as a delivery of postal cards, then they should also carry addresses. 
so for a specific address they should be delivered in a specific place now here once we have the polypeptide with a specific address signal sequence then that polypeptide remain attached with several different proteins and we call them HSP HSP heat shock protein so simply HSP 70 playing an important role by involving in interaction with the polypeptide chain and that allows the protein not to be misfolded and it will allow the protein to be properly guided towards this destination now the idea is how exactly the protein should be transported in the mitochondria for any type of transport we know that we should have any transporter that is known as translocon also known as translocator in all those target organelles so in mitochondria also we have the translocon and actually there are three types of translocons that we are interested to talk about the one type is team complex second one is a tom tom complex and the third one is oxa these are the three types of translocons that are involved in the process of transport of polypeptide inside the mitochondria now if we look at team there are two types of team that are found in the process of translocator that is team 23 and team 22 now let's begin with the idea of a protein delivery into the mitochondrial matrix now the thing is now let's let me erase this part and let's say let's draw some of these translocons now the first translocon that we'll draw will be the tom complex so let's draw the tom complex tom complex carries two different regions one is the receptor another one is the channel the transporter associated with the tom complex that all together is known as the tom complex containing two units a receptor and a translocator which carries a channel now what happens here the target protein the polypeptide with the signal sequence binds to the receptor so let me draw it here here we go and the rest of the polypeptide attached with all those heat shock proteins this attached to the tom complex then what it will do is tom complex utilizes energy from the atp hydrolysis and helps to transfer this chain through this channel into the mitochondrial matrix but tom complex the drawing in this picture is not clear it's a wrong drawing up to this region i draw it wrong because to make you realize that there is a reason most of the people make mistake so the idea here is tom complex is not two membrane spanning that's the wrong thing about this drawing the drawing should should be like this so let me change it like this so tom complex is only present in one membrane that is the outer membrane of mitochondria only remember that okay tom complex cannot directly insert the target polypeptide into the mitochondrial matrix it requires the help of another complex that is known as the team 23 complex without team 23 tom complex will not be able to transfer the polypeptide inside the mitochondrial matrix alone keep this thing in your mind because a lot of time questions being asked from this region in CSI net exam and people make mistake in this point now why because if you look at the structure here here we have a team complex the, the thing about team complex is team complex also contains a channel region but it also contains an anchor domain that is attached to the both inner and outer membrane so with the help of this anchor region of team 23 protein is anchored to both inner and outer mitochondrial membrane but the actual translocator is located in the inner membrane so team 23 start aligning itself to this tom translocator so that both of them together creates a tunnel through both inner and outer mitochondrial membrane as they create a complete tunnel through which this target protein can insert into the matrix so now this ATP hydrolysis here 
provides the energy and that allows the transfer of this polypeptide through the storm and team 23 complex into the mitochondrial matrix now this process requires ATP and also it requires proton gradient we all know that there's a proton gradient across the mitochondrial inner membrane right more protons out in the inner membrane space compared to the matrix of the mitochondria that proton gradient helps the movement of the proteins inside but there is another important protein that helps in the process of the transport of the polypeptide into the matrix and that is mitochondrial heat shock protein 70 or mitochondrial hsp 70 we know the hsp 70 that is involved in this process here is known as the cytosolic hsp 70 but once it's inside like for example say here once a little part once a little bit of the polypeptide start taking entry let's say this is the polypeptide start taking entry inside the matrix that signal sequence soon will be recognized by different peptidase enzymes and they will cleave uh, the polypeptide right after the signal sequence so the fragment of signal sequence will be removed and released into the matrix and while rest of the polypeptide needs to be dragged in inside the cell so how exactly they can drag it inside the mitochondrial matrix with the help of another mitochondrial hsp70 so once it's taking entry inside mitochondrial hsp70 start attached start attaching itself with it and it also takes energy source from atp hydrolysis sorry and this is the energy driven process while every single round the ATP gets hydrolyzed, the HSP70 position itself in a separate conformation along with the polypeptide by calling it bridge ratcheting movement or call it cross bridge ratcheting movement. That is just imagine you are pulling something in. So just imagine this polypeptide as a rope and the job here is to pull that rope inside the mitochondrial matrix and to do that is you have your hands so what you do create a rusheting movement the idea of rusheting movement is moving things in the opposite direction so that it creates a tension that drags uh, the polypeptide in this case into the mitochondrial matrix and that is what with the help of mitochondrial hsp70 that are present inside the mitochondrial matrix only so once that thing is done the polypeptide will be transferred into the mitochondrial matrix so that is the job uh, of transferring a mitochondrial matrix proteins inside the mitochondria with the help of team 23 and tom complex now the term is the idea is sometimes also to put a protein into the inner mitochondrial membrane now in that case what we can do for the transfer of a protein into the inner mitochondrial membrane we also need a separate signal sequence now in those cases the protein contains two signal sequences the first signal sequence is to deliver the protein towards mitochondria and the second signal sequence is to properly embed it into the inner mitochondrial membrane right so here once the process of delivery of, of the protein into the matrix is almost done so once once the polypeptides start entering there the first signal sequence gets cleaved at this point they found out the second signal sequence and let's say the second signal sequence is the sequence for embedding it into the inner mitochondrial membrane then what they will do is there is another translocator that is present in the inner mitochondrial membrane itself and one of such is oxa another one is the team 22 so both of them oxa and team 22 are kind of translocator that are present in the inner mitochondrial membrane and have and do the job of transferring uh, that target polypeptide containing the inner membrane spanning region to the inner membrane of the mitochondria okay now between oxa and team 22 they have separate job of either transferring a single pass protein or transferring multi pass protein inside normally here you see the oxa will do the job of transferring a single transmembrane protein into the inner membrane of mitochondria while team 22 complex 
uh, will do the job of transpanning proteins into the inner mitochondrial membrane. Now, <clears throat> the work will be very similar that sometimes they can transfer the complete protein into the mitochondrial matrix and then they embed it or sometimes even during the process of transport once they found out the signal region for embedding it into the inner mitochondrial membrane they just transfer it from one translocator to the next and put it into the inner mitochondrial membrane that's how the process of mitochondrial protein delivery is done okay so now the final question about mitochondrial protein delivery is why at all we need mitochondrial protein delivery and the answer to that is very simple mitochondria is powerhouse of our body because it helps in generating a lot of energy in terms of ATP because if you look at cellular respiration in the oxidative mode aerobic mode of cellular respiration the maximum ATP generated with the help of electron transport chain is occurring in the mitochondria and in that case mitochondria are playing a vital role of doing so so it requires so many enzymes and all those are proteins so we need to produce them in the cytosol and transfer them to the mitochondria so that the mitochondria can function properly and keep generating the energy source for the cell to talk about the transport of proteins into the lysosome till now we've been talking about the transport of proteins in different organelles of a cell we've seen the transport of proteins in mitochondria transport of the proteins to the chloroplast the nucleus and peroxisomes but all those pathways that we saw like transport of a protein to the mitochondria or chloroplast they requires the transport of the protein from cytosol itself because in those cases the proteins are made in the cytosol without being involved and ended up in in the inside the lumen of endoplasmic reticulum but in this case of transferring a protein into the lysosome we will see that the protein is produced and, and inserted in, inside the endoplasmic reticulum then it will be packaged inside the vesicle transported from there and then only they will form lysosome so it's a part of a endomembrane system how it looks like if we think of an idea that these are the endoplasmic reticulum somehow linked let's imagine should draw it like let's say let's say this is an endoplasmic reticulum and right after that we have the golgi apparatus right and so on we have the golgi apparatus and let's say this is all lysosome So to understand the pathway of how a protein is delivered inside the lysosome, you need to know the sequence of the events. And to understand the sequence of the events, it starts with endoplasmic reticulum, then the Golgi apparatus, then the other uh, structures like endosome, many other structures, and then finally will be the destination called lysosome. So what is it? If we begin here, the idea of protein synthesis is going on in the endoplasmic reticulum itself because the ribosome is there in the endoplasmic reticulum and, and it is making the polypeptide sequence, making the polypeptide sequences. And once the polypeptide sequence is made, once the protein is made, it will be inserted inside the endoplasmic reticulum lumen. So once the protein is inserted inside the endoplasmic reticulum lumen, then the second job is to make a vesicle where the protein will be inserted. So vesicles start forming including the target proteins and then they will be delivered towards the Golgi apparatus. So if I draw it here, the vesicles start forming the structure like that. And here will be this proteins moving inside the vesicle and that protein will now go and fuse with the Golgi apparatus and actually those vesicles will fuse with themselves as a result uh, the Golgi will start actually Golgi is formed with the help of the interaction of those vesicles 
and the target protein is transferred to the Golgi apparatus. So once that thing is done, then what happens in Golgi is those proteins are modified. In different sense, there are different chemical modifications. In this case, let's say the modif let's say this protein is hydrolase. This is a hydrolase protein that we are tracking. Now the protein that is in the Golgi apparatus should be modified. In this case, the modification is, let's say, uh, addition of uh, sugar. Let us say mannose. Addition of mannose. And not only the addition of mannose, but also there is another modif modification that is the modification of mannose itself. That is phosphorylation of mannose. So the mannose gets phosphorylated and converted into the 6-phosphate. So mannose 6-phosphate is formed in the structure of the hydrolase enzyme. And that all alteration takes place in the Golgi apparatus during the movement of the protein through the Golgi channel or Golgi network. Now once mannose 6-phosphate is formed, then finally that same protein moves towards the terminal part of the Golgi because you know if you look at the Golgi, there are cis, medial and trans. So once it's there at the end, those mannose along with the, uh, those, those proteins, hydrolase with the mannose 6-phosphate binds to the mannose 6-phosphate receptor that is also present in the Golgi apparatus membrane, it's embedded in the membrane. So if you look at here, let's, let's draw the mannose 6-phosphate receptor with a different color. Let's draw it with the red color. So this is the mannose 6-phosphate receptor which binds to the mannose 6-phosphate of the hydrolase enzyme and once this thing is done then it will start creating the vesicles and start pinching out from the Golgi network and then it is transported if I draw it throughout the structures then it will be transported towards lysosome and even before becoming a lysosome the, this vesicles are itself uh, has the capability to convert itself into a lysosome. The only difference is lysosome can, contains many of these enzymes, hydrolases, many of the peptidase, lipase and many of these enzymes all together and also they have a very acidic pH. So at the very beginning if you look at the if you look at the vesicle it has this mannose 6-phosphate receptor while uh, the hydrolase with mannose 6-phosphate attaches to it. At this particular condition, there is an ATPS pump or you can say proton pump that is present. Through this pump, ATP hydrolysis is required as an energy source there and that helps driving protons inside this vesicle structure which is known as early endosome. This is the start and initiator point of formation of a lysosome known as early endosome. And in this endosome, as ATP hydrolysis is uh, there and it helps in the transport of protons inside the vesicle that makes the environment acidic. Due to this acidic environment, that 6-phosphate of this mannose residue gets released. And as a result, the target hydrolase is also getting released. So as the, as the acidity As that acidity slowly start to rise there, the protein, the target protein along with the mannose residue gets released because the phosphate gets released due to the high ac acidity. And it also causes uh, this other structure of the, of the vesicle that is mannose 6 receptor to completely dissociated from the hydrolase enzyme. And as a result, we have this high proton content inside now and we also have a one hydrolase enzyme inside. This is the way many different hydrolytic enzymes are delivered inside this matured endo endosome. I call, call it like late endosome. Now once this late endo endosome slowly start to acquire more and more of these hydrolyzing enzymes, lipase, uh, protease and all this type of enzymes slowly start to build up and making this acidic environment, then that sac will be known as lysosome. 
So while we're talking about delivery of proteins to the lysosome, it's not like lysosome is preformed and the protein gets delivered, but it's actually during the process of this transport, lysosome is being formed from early endosome, then late endosome, then the modification of that into the lysosome. That is a process of lysosomal protein transport. We are going to talk about nuclear transport. In past few video lectures, we're discussing about the different modes of protein transport inside a cell. Here we're interested about how the proteins are delivered inside nucleus. Now the first question is, why we need to deliver proteins inside the nucleus? Because the idea of protein synthesis always takes place in the cytosol. While mRNA is produced in the nucleus, transport it into the cytosol and then it's translated into the target proteins. Now here, if you remember in eukaryotes, the DNA is wrapped around histones and histones should be delivered inside the nucleus so that the nucleosome structure can form. So this is one example where we see the requirement of protein delivery inside the nucleus. So the question is how exactly the process of nuclear transport will be mediated. If you look at the nuclear structure, you will see there are nuclear pore that are found in the nuclear envelope. So there are gaps. If we zoom into the structure of nuclear pore in a schematic drawing, what we can see is something like this. I'll try to draw a structure similar like this, like this. Similarly, let, let me draw another structure in this side as well. Okay, let's say it will look something like this and it will look something like this. So this is kind of an overall schematic drawing for the nuclear pore in a side view. If you look at from top, this is the top region of the pore. And there are different nuclear uh, ring and basket structures and there is also these arms coming in and out of a nuclear pore. And rest of the regions are the nuclear envelope that as we know. Now here what we are interested in is to think about how different proteins go inside the nucleus and come outside of the nucleus. Now to understand that first thing that you know is that if there are smaller proteins that can easily diffuse through this uh, nuclear pore, nuclear envelope pore into the nucleus. Okay, But for big proteins like histone, they cannot take direct entry. They require an active transport process, right? So there are these two processes, passive, passive transport for smaller proteins and active transport for large proteins like histones. Here we will see how exactly the active transport across the nuclear envelope is carried out. For that to understand what you need to know is we need to know about a protein known as RAN. RAN is a protein which is vital for the transfer of target proteins in and out of a nucleus. Now RAN is a GTP bonding protein. So RAN can bind with GTP or GTP. The idea is whenever it's GTP form, RAN remain attached to it. But once GTP gets hydrolyzed into GDP and PI, GDP will be released from the RAN and RAN protein will become free. So think about the cycle of RAN, GTP and GDP first. This is the primary thing that you should understand before talking about the protein transport. So let's look at the RAN, GTP, GDP cycle. The idea here is simply to create RAN along with GTP inside the nucleus. That is the idea. So actually let me draw it, oh, let me draw it inside the nucleus. So RAN attached with GTP. While on the other hand, when there is GDP, an inorganic phosphate is re released from there after the hydrolysis of GTP, that RAN will be outside of the nucleus. So these are the two states for RAN. Now they keep circulating between the states. For example, if I draw an arrow to explain this thing to you, it will be like this. 
So as you see, when wine attached to GTP only gets the license to go out, go out of the nucleus. Remember this, this is very very important. So if RAN is attached with GTP, then only it have the license to it has the license to transfer out of the nucleus. And once the GTP gets hydrolyzed into GDP and PI, that will be released, and that RAN will not be able to to go in. Uh, that RAN will only be able to go in in the GDP attached form. So this cycle repeated several times. So the process working in a way that only RAN GTP can go out and RAN without any GDP or in, with the GDP form can only come inside or in a free RAN can only come inside. Now the question is how exactly it remain attached to GTP or get hydrolyzed. There are accessory proteins involved in substituting RAN GDP with GTP and also hydrolyzing GTP into GDP. Those factors are named as GAP and GIF. We need an enzyme known as GEF or guanine nucleotide exchange factor that helps in the process of transfer of GTP and release of GDP. So it substitutes GDP with GTP in the RAM. While there is another protein known as GAP. known as GTPS activating protein and GTPS activating protein helps in the hydrolysis of GTP into GDP which is acting outside of the nucleus. So here you can see GIF, I don't think you can see the bottom part anyways, till here I will explain. GIF transfers GTP, attach GTP to RAN while GAP helps in hydrolyzing GTP into GTP plus PI. GAP works in the nucleus, GAP works outside of the nucleus in the cytosol. Now they cannot shuffle this place. So they have separate regions for working. So once you understand this cycle of RAN, GTP and GDP, now it's time to understand how the cargo protein will be delivered in or out. Now for transporting this cargo proteins, this RAN protein cannot directly bind to the cargo. You know what is cargo? Cargo is the exact protein that needs to be delivered. Okay. So RAN is unable to directly bind with cargo. So here comes the cargo protein, but RAN cannot directly interact. So it has a third protein to interact with both and known as importing or exporting. We also call, call them like nuclear import receptor or nuclear export receptor. Okay, The import receptor involved in the process of importing a protein in the nucleus while export receptor process the job of transferring a protein from the nucleus into the cytosol. Okay, So while we are transferring mRNA, exporting play important role while we are taking histones inside the nucleus import receptors are important plays a vital role. So here let's first talk about this import receptor. The idea is we simply draw it as S shaped proteins. If you draw as an S shaped protein what you will see is there are two domains, two regions where two separate things can bind. So one region where the cargo can bind and another region where the RAN can bind. Okay, and now this receptor proteins can go in and out. So in this case, we are looking at import receptor. So import receptor working in a way that their job is to transfer a cargo protein inside the nucleus. Now the idea here is we have those we have those as shaped proteins out there, and let's say cargo gets attached to one of the domains. And the other region where the RAN bound is the RAN GDP. So binding of RAN GDP will not allow uh, this cargo protein to be to be removed here. Because if you look at the structure of these import receptors, you will find that this import receptor can bind with cargo and RAN in GDP form only. But if the RAN is present, 
in GTP form, then cargo will be removed. Because while RAN in GTP form attaches there, it alters the structure of this import receptor that causes the cargo to be removed. So here at the beginning, either we have the import receptor with only cargo or even though we have RAN, uh, the RAN should be free from any GTP. So here we go with RAN. And then this import receptor goes inside. Because for going inside, we don't need any signal. We don't need RAN GTP, nothing. So now it's transferred inside the cell, uh, inside the nucleus. Once it's inside the nucleus, which I will draw here. So this is uh, how it looks like here. Inside the nucleus, we have the cargo and uh, the RAN is there. So now the idea is, once this GIF transfers the GTP to the RAN, RAN becomes attached with GTP. And this RAN GTP, as I told you, if the import receptor bound to RAN GTP, it undergoes a conformational change that will kick the cargo out. So here once the RAN GTP is attached, cargo will be removed and thus will be delivered inside. Actually this process is working inside the nucleus. I don't have much space because uh, the board is ending here. I think the view is ending here. That's why I am drawing it here. But actually this means inside. This is the border. This is inside the nucleus. Okay. So once RAN GTP is attached there, cargo protein falls off and it's delivered inside the nucleus. That's how easy it is. And then the RAN, uh, then we have this import receptor with RAN GTP. It will be transported out. And once it's transported out, that ran GTP again hydrolyzed into GDP makes the receptor again free to interact with a second cargo and the process continues like that okay so that's the job repeating for the import of a protein inside the nucleus now import receptor structure and function is little different from the export receptor because I told you if ran GTP bound then the import receptor removes the cargo. But export receptor doesn't work in that way. Export receptor works in a way that the job is to transfer something outside. So export receptor can bind the cargo and RAN GTP at the same time without any problem. And that's what they have to do. So what happens during export, we have RAN GTP attached in one part of the export receptor and cargo to one part of the export receptor okay so this is for the export okay and then it will be transported out so transferred out into the cytosol while in the cytosol the ran gtp gets hydrolyzed with the help of gap that will cause the cargo to be delivered out and then again we have a export receptor free the free export receptor will take entry inside the nucleus so by looking at this overall cycle one thing you can say is that nucleus is kind of free for different proteins and molecules to take entry but it's very specific for molecules to exit the nucleus and it's quite logical because if you think importing things inside the nucleus there are different proteins and stuff that may be required or may not but while exporting there are mRNA and important messengers that should be transported out of this nucleus very cautiously. Now, if they don't have a tight regulation over the export, then it might create a misleading, a bad effect to the cell. Let's say an mRNA is transported out of the nucleus without being properly edited and, and spliced, then that will create a big issue. That's the reason there's a tight control of export rather than import. But in both the cases, import receptors and export receptors play a vital role along with the RAN GTP and RAN GDP for controlling the cycle of movement of proteins in and out of the nucleus. But remember one more thing is the RAN GTP is the only form while attached to the export receptor will get the signal to be transported out of the nucleus. Okay, And the same RAN GTP while bound to the import receptor will cause the cargo protein to be released and delivered inside the nucleus. So I hope you understand the overall idea of nuclear 
transport of proteins. If you like this video, please hit the like button, share this video with your friends and subscribe to my channel to get more and more videos like that. Thank you.